I'm a associate or assistant professor at the Tyler School of Art at Temple University. Um, and uh, my research is in robotics and materials, and uh, uh, specifically in composites. And today, I'm going to be talking mostly about uh, recent composites, uh, some composites work I've been doing. Um, also, in addition to this, I, um, I'm a board member of Acadia, um, an editor of several journals, and recently just uh, finished the book towards a robotic architecture. Uh, with uh, Mahesh Das, and several of the people here are parts of, uh, have been uh, parts of this book as well. Um, so um, today, uh, basically what I'm gonna be talking about is uh, uh, carbon fiber, um, and not necessarily as, uh, as a tool for um, efficiency, but more towards a, a tool of changing how we interact with materials and how basically we can rethink uh, of what a material in a building is or in an artifact could be. Uh, none of these are buildings, they're more like, they're more artifact-like. Um, and so when you, when you take away the sort of the, the material properties that we're used to in architecture and basically start with a material that has no given form, um, you can begin to think about how things, uh, how forms and textures and, and uh, the senses can inform the, the, the artifact more than if we start with a piece of drywall or a two by four piece of standardized material. Um, now in composites, there are certain things that I'm interested in, in pursuing and seeing how these things begin to redefine what, what built artifacts are. And some of those are uh, how you can begin to create new production typologies, um, the new types of physical attributes that these materials lend themselves uh, to, to doing, um, and new sensorial attributes as well. And so moving again towards like how we interface with things. And so in terms of uh, production ty uh, typologies, some of the projects that I'll briefly touch on today, um, since we have a short amount of time, I'm just gonna introduce projects, um, are uh, looking at composites that are layered um, and how those different, uh, differenti differentiate each other through uh, a single layer, a si single direction or multi-layer directions, um, uh, carbon fiber winding, um, either through a cord structure or, or a cordless structure, um, woven carbon fiber, um, knit carbon fiber, and uh, offset 3D winding. Um, I'm not going to talk so much about the, the last two, and I'll introduce you or, to woven or knit, but I will introduce you briefly to some projects that we're starting now with offset 3D winding. Um, and some of the things that these relate to are whether they're flexible, rig, uh, rigid, uh, predictable, unpredictable, and how you can create a, a gradient between uh, those, those sorts of uh, constraints. Um, so I've been working on smaller scale projects uh, recently uh, that from kites to sort of little one person enclosures to a larger project dinner for six which has to finish in October which will be roughly four meters by four meters, so larger scale projects. Um, but today, kind of a fun project that I got pulled into when I uh, came to Temple was this uh, project uh, Cloud Magnet. Um, which I won't go into, but basically it was for the creation of these, uh, these cloud-making kites that we're still working on now. Um, but some of the two, th uh, two of the things that we were thinking about within these were, well, with carbon fiber, we know it's strong. Uh, we know it's flexible, but what are the attributes to both of these and how can we begin to blur the strength? Whereas uh, this is 100 grams of carbon fiber for a current project I'm working on. Uh, whole, uh, basically buckling in programmed ways to, uh, with over 450 kilograms worth of force being applied to it. Um, so we know it's extremely strong, but the thing here that was really interesting was actually seeing how the material deformed in a way that was either planned or unplanned. And how even after things began to fail, the structure continued to carry a load and do what we were um, expecting it to do. Two things that were very flexible, so this is a quarter scale prototype of the, uh, of the, the structure of the cloud magnet proto uh, project, which uh, basically was roughly a meter and a half in diameter, but was able to collapse down to like a, roughly half a meter in diameter. It was very important because these were flown in Costa Rica, so we needed to get them there um, uh, very easily. Um, in the studies for that though, we looked at many different types of winding methodologies and, and these helped inform uh, the structure but also how things could begin to work. So we started with 
cores and, and making very tight weaves, which were extremely, extremely strong. And we looked at different ways of layering them, uh, different ways of winding or beginning to knit the structures, which added more and more, uh, 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 more and more structural attributes. But the problem was that one, you were forcing a material to do something it didn't want to do. Uh, but also in bringing it to Costa Rica, you would wind up with uh, at full scale a 16 foot long or five meter or is that no, or four meter, four meter long uh, structure that would be impossible to ship to Costa Rica, especially since it weighs less than a pound. Um, so we began thinking about this in, in different ways of, of using different types of winding and beginning to program structure based on winding versus uh, on um, on uh, material itself. And so here we can see this different states of this one kite. So from the far, the far side is overextended down to its compressed form. Um, so although it's strong, we can make it do various things. Uh, also beginning to control the gradient uh, of, of structure. So the top is the most flexible, the bottom is the weakest, but also we can begin to add additional structure to the top and bottom through uh, these control rings. Um, and then basically beginning to program form based on how things are wound together versus coming up with uh, like a design and, and just try to force it, the material to do what you want. Uh, we basically developed different types of uh, frameworks for this. So the goal was to have zero waste while working with carbon fiber, at least for me. Um, and so this was a reusable early prototype where everything was wound in string first and then it was fired in a kiln and then basically unrolled uh, so that it became, uh, the carbon fiber remained rigid, but the string could be used over and over again. Um, and so going from one to the other, uh, then we moved to a larger scale, uh, larger kilns. Uh, we're using kiln fired carbon fiber just because it's, uh, the, the resin is more stable and less toxic. So we don't want to be mixing things. Um, and so uh, here you can see we moved to a larger scale. Um, basically, again, uh, everything is, this could be very simply disassembled. So there's very little waste. Um, and then the structure is extremely predictable. Another reason for the carbon fiber is that we have lots of sensors and electronics embedded within the structure. And so when you're basically working with fibrous materials, fibrous electronics fit very well into the system. And so they could basically be woven into the structure as well. Um, and then uh, for the kites, for instance, we're using a PCM embedded uh, uh, fiber reinforced uh, fiber or a plastic reinforced plastic skin. Um, and so the early prototypes of students were um, hand, like basically hand embedding the, the, the PCM in here. Uh, but basically the goal was through the form of this structure or of this kite and then the skin with the embedded PCM that we could moderate the temp or control the temperature from the bottom, uh, from the input to the, uh, to, the, to the output of the kite to change the, the air temperature. Um, over the, the several days in Costa Rica, we got huge amounts of uh, data uh, in uh, basically the material, uh, how the air was changing temperature and how the humidity was raising. And so now we're redesigning the kites based on that data. Um, just real quick, uh, where this is going, um, we're continuing with the cloud, magic, uh, the cloud magnet pro uh, project, uh, working with more robustly uh, like impregnated skins with PCM and different types of PCM. Uh, also, we're rethinking the carbon fiber structure and how it's made as well as with the form so that it, it works better. This kite didn't fly amazingly. It, it was also much more windy than we thought on the mountains of Costa Rica. So that was kind of fun. Uh, the Dinner for Sticks project does not look like this anymore, but this was an early prototype. Uh, but this will be realized at full scale again by October when my funding runs out. <laughs> and so um, these are a series of projects I'm doing with my friend Masood at uh, Penn, uh, looking at multi-layered carbon fiber structures. So we'll be expanding this uh, much further. And then that is going into a new large scale table that we're building um, called the tipping table, which is a hybrid uh, compression and tension based uh, multi-layered carbon fiber structure. So um, this is like a very small sort of strand of what I'm kind of working on. I tried to keep it to the, hopefully the fun stuff, at least for me. Uh, so um, thank you guys very much. And thank you, Philip, for having me. Well, the first version did not, well, we got a lot of data, but it wasn't like, uh, basically we were seeing it of its two ways. One, hopefully it would fly, but if it didn't on a, like they were gonna put it in a pole. And so basically they just held it on a pole as more of like a windsock for the first one. So now we're taking what we got and redesigning it. 
Uh, but for this first test, the, the goal was really just to make sure, like, to make sure that how we were designing it was doing what we wanted to do in terms of uh, change, lowering the temperature within the kite and then raising the humidity within the, within the kite as well. And so those parts worked. Uh, we need to uh, increase it more to basically hopefully get some sort of like visual uh, cue within the, the cloud forest of, of, um, of like, a, a cl not like a real cloud, but just like something where you can see it. But uh, uh, yeah, it didn't fly as much, but we'll get, we'll get there for the next part. <laughs> if there's, a, yeah? Yes. Yeah, so the, um, we're using, so I actually work with the ceramics department, I think, as I, as I had mentioned uh, in bef before uh, to you. But yeah, um, the, re the, the carbon fiber I'm using is like, uh, it's typically made for making rocket boosters. And so it has a, it has a resin system that is pre-pregnated, that has a longer shelf life, but is less toxic. Um, and so that means it has to be fired in a kiln, which then it basically activates the carbon fiber once it gets to a certain temperature and you fire it just like you'd fire a piece of ceramic. And so it's basically a ramp up to a certain temperature, hold for four hours, ramp down. And in that time, six hours, basically, you wind up with your final artifact. Um, so very similar. That's why I love working with the ceramics people. 